I, I guess if WebEx works, I'll be doing this from uh, Denver from sitting in my hotel room. So anyway, it's great to be with you guys. Now, Dan, I think you're going to advance the slides for me. Sure. Is that correct? Okay, let's we we'll jump to the next one then. So so when we talked about it, you know, I'm going to kind of hit about three kind of big topics, and one is, you know, sort of a, a natural resource look of, of agriculture. Remember that we kind of get on the on the base of uh, you know why we can do the stuff we can do uh, in terms of production agriculture, growing things. Then we'll talk about ag and the economy. We'll talk about some current uh, financial conditions in agriculture. Uh, and a couple other things, and we can jump to questions, however you want to handle it, Dan. Uh, just let me know if we want to, uh, you know, however you want to do questions. It works for me. Yeah, we will. So, we'll be watching chats as we go through here, but, um, and Julie, you might help me if you can look at that and just kind of write down some of those questions. And go ahead, Dave. Cool. Uh, you know, I, I thought I'd start with this, you know, really the idea of, you know, what, what do we do where and why and there's a there's a couple of kind of our natural resource type things and, and i i kind of i got a couple of maps here that i think are pretty useful to at least remind us some stuff and and as an economist i got to start with that bullet that says what can we do profitably because if you know if we can't make any money doing it we're not going to do it for very long and so so I, you know coming from my economist background i think the first map i'll show you on that next slide is that we think about sort of our vegetational areas uh this is, you know, where, you know, kind of the regions of the state. And I think, you know, sometimes not everybody's going to be familiar with the terms like rolling plains or cross timbers or things like that. And it, I find that, that sometimes some of those terms have, you know, we just don't use those very often. Yet, you know, if we think about the regions of the state and what kinds of agriculture they can support, we have some really unique areas. You think of the Edwards Plateau which is the center of really sheep and goat production, the largest sheep and goat production producing area in the U.S. So, uh, you know, I, I like to start with that sort of the idea we think about, you know, the, the regions that we have. And yet that really relates to kind of the next slide, which is, you know, what I call from 60 inches to 6 inches. If we think about how much rainfall we get from Beaumont to El Paso, uh, rainfall defines so much of what we can do in agriculture, whether, you know, grazing livestock, our stocking rates, uh, the kinds of dry land crops we can grow, uh, really de depends on our rainfall. Uh, and if we extended this map to the whole U.S., rainfall patterns, you know, the further west we go, the less rainfall we get. And it really defines so much of, of what we do in terms of agriculture on the plains, uh, it, it relates to the, you know, the, the long run, you know, the series of droughts and flooding that we have are very much related to really this, this rainfall patterns and what we can produce where. Uh, you know, I, I think a running theme through a lot of our agricultural stuff is, is, if we jump to the next slide, is we think about, you know, changes in innovation. Uh, in agriculture, we're always changing. We're always trying something new. We're always innovating. So we start with rainfall, yet pretty soon we jump to irrigation and pumping groundwater and all kinds of technological changes that have made, uh, in, in a lot of cases, production agriculture possible if we think about at least crop agriculture possible up on the high plains uh, with, with irrigation and our aquifers that, that we have. Uh, really is, uh, and if we jump to the next slide, I, I, I just included this for sort of completeness where we get kind of the major aquifers where we're able to pump water and, and use this kind of technology all the way from, you know, old time windmills to, to drip irrigation that we do today. And, and just an idea of those resources that we have in production, in production agriculture. So with that just sort of a, of, a, of a backdrop, I found I've kind of used these slides a lot over time. So we'll kind of jump to agriculture in the economy. And I started with this, uh, hey, we're number two. Uh, and, and the reason I say that, you know, we don't like talking about being number two. But it, it's funny, a couple of years ago, I got a I got a call from uh, one of our U.S. senators' offices, and the senator was used was was had used the 
the statistic in a speech that agriculture was the second largest industry in the in the Texas economy. And then they decided they might want to check that and decide if that was true or not, since he'd already been using that in his speech for a while. So, uh, you know, we jumped in and, and uh, kind of went through some of the statistics we used to, could we support that? And so if we look at the next slide, I've got about three or four slides here in a row putting the our agriculture economy in the in, in the context of the state economy. All of these figures come from an extension publication called the the contribution of the food and fiber system to Texas's gross domestic product. Uh, so this food and fiber system publication we do every other year. It comes out uh, ahead of the legislative session. Uh, and has been distributed pretty widely. Really, we're, we're really trying to put you know agriculture in the context of the economy. Uh, we've been doing that publication for about uh, my gosh, 15, 18 years or so. Uh, I, I was recent. I, our latest one came, we came we published in November of last year, ahead of the session. Uh, and I looked at the back for those of us who worked on it. I'm the last remaining. Mohican from the very first time we did this uh, publication. But, you know, I think this first part, if, if we look at the state's gross domestic product, which is how we sort of measure uh, uh, the size of the economy, and we start looking at this food and fiber system, you know, we don't just want to look at production agriculture. We don't just want to look at crops. Uh, we don't eat much cotton, and yet cotton's a major crop for us. And so it's part of this food and fiber system. Wool and mohair is another one of those fibers. Uh, we also want to go beyond just the field or the pasture. So we want to capture agriculture throughout this. So if we, we kind of look at this little pie chart here, uh, go back to the, that one, Dan, with the pie chart, uh, you get an idea that, 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 that agriculture, our food and fiber system, makes up of about 9% of the Texas economy. Uh, we lump a bunch of things together in some of this. If you were to bust out uh, uh, oil, uh, chemicals into separate categories, what you end up with is that Texas, that the food and fiber system is the second largest uh, sector of the Texas economy. And so we kind of we we've got a bunch of these categories, so you get a notion of, of where it fits and and what kind of importance it has. So on the next slide, uh, to look at this in a different way, we're kind of interested in how uh, that contribution to state gross domestic product changes over time. So we got a little bar chart there showing the Texas economy, uh, about 1.6, whatever that is, trillion dollars. Uh, about 9% of it in 2016 was agriculture. Uh, the uh, Sometimes that, that agriculture portion changes a little, little bit, and sometimes it change. we can have a growing agriculture economy, but if the rest of the economy is growing faster, agriculture share gets smaller. So here's just, you know, some notions of kind of a little bit last 10 years or so of, of where agriculture fits uh, and what its contribution is. So that next slide... Uh, we, you know, we we always get the question. So, what's our leading agriculture commodities? So, when we put this together, it's not meant to be an all-inclusive list. I always get somebody asking me, "Hey, how come such and such isn't in there or whatever?" Well, you know, no offense, we weren't. <laughs> but if we look at sort of some leading agriculture commodities, their cash receipts, the contribution to gross domestic product. Uh, you can kind of see a whole set of them there. Clearly, I think something many of us would know, beef, cattle, and calves is the biggest uh, agricultural commodity we have in the state. And we go all the way from cow-calf production to feedlots in the panhandle in there. Uh, David, that cotton is the number one largest row crop. Uh, if you if you added up the livestock parts, you know, cattle, dairy, broilers, eggs, uh, sheep and goats, you know that's a that's a huge portion of total agriculture. Uh, yet we also we we've got timber in there as well as a product of the land of the state. So uh, you know we we try to kind of get a notion of what that contribution is. 
And and so, you know, I think it gives us a nice idea within that 9% of the economy what, how much of these different critters we deal with uh, contributing. So, David? Yes, sir. So, on, when you talk about cash receipts, that's just the sale of those agricultural products uh, to the next part of the process. Hey, Dan, and I can't hear you very good. Okay. I think we're getting some kind of feedback. Let's try that again. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask this question at the end. So the question is, what's up with cash receipts? Yeah, so the question is, what's up with cash receipts? Can you explain cash receipts? All right, Dave, go ahead. If everyone can mute their minds to stop speaking. Hey, Dan, you still there? So, Dave, go ahead and keep talking. Okay, I heard you then. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so, um, anyway, uh, gosh, I forgot where I was. <laughs> May be better that way. Um, so, anyway, let's let's jump on. Maybe we can get to that question a little bit. Let's let's kind of jump to the next slide, uh, Dan. All right, uh, and and really. You know, I think in putting this into context, we want to. One of the things we want to do is we want to go. We want to go beyond the farm gate with this about agriculture's role in the economy. Uh, we wanted to get people to think. You know, some of the people who read this publication, some of the people in the legislature and staffers and whatnot. You know, we want to get them thinking about agriculture's reach throughout the economy. So that next slide, the last one out of this publication that we do. Um, We've made an attempt to go beyond the farm gate uh, to the uh, kind of the where some of these other uh, areas of the Texas economy, like manufacturing, uh, wholesale and retail trade. By that we mean wholesale and retail business, not exports and imports necessarily. Some of these other uh, portions, but because the agriculture system, you know, we truck stuff. We truck stuff to the to a packing plant. We truck stuff to a gin. The gin goes on. The gin's the cotton. The cotton moves on to the next step in the process. Wheat goes to a flour mill, goes to a bakery, gets turned into bread. And, and uh, you know, we want to get beyond just the farm gate to the rest of this processing system. And that's that's sort of what we do there where we're taking what – so we've got there what portion of wholesale and retail – business is agricultural business or is the business of agricultural products in the next step. And you'll see that that food and fiber system contribution gets down. There's that 9.1% of Texas's gross domestic product is the contribution of our food and fiber system. So I think, you know, I think our, our using this, we I, I think it's been a fairly successful little publication in terms of getting folks who may not think beyond the farm gate to think about where this goes in the rest of the system. So I think that's been pretty uh, pretty useful for us. Um, let's jump to the next slide. I think the, yeah, I, I think this next part's going to be kind of current conditions in agriculture. Uh, so go ahead. Uh, you know, if we look at current conditions, I think one of the running themes lately has been of financial struggles in agriculture over the last couple of years. I see a lot more uh, uh, publications, uh, discussion from all the way from the uh, Federal Reserve Bank to USDA about financial struggles in agriculture. We're generally dealing with low commodity prices. We're in, in about the third year of some disastrously poor prices in the dairy side. Uh, to the point that uh, we have dairy farms, particularly smaller farms, going out of business really across the country. Uh, to, the prices have been low enough, long enough, 
that they just can't hang on anymore. And this is the next, we're going through the next big sort of ringing out of smaller producers in the dairy industry really across the country. Uh, we've got uh, low commodity prices for all of our major crops. You know, and I would folks particularly, uh, you know, corn and soybeans get more of the headlines lately. Uh, cattle, as you would, you, many of you might know, it's a cyclical industry. We're expanding our cow herds and prices are falling. Uh, you know, within this whole financial struggle uh, uh, type of thing, uh, certainly tariffs fall into that. The tariffs, the, the, the uh, various trade wars, the re tariffs and retaliatory tariffs are particularly hitting some of our agricultural commodities much harder than others. Uh, soybeans are, are one. Pork is another uh, where many of these tariffs and retaliatory tariffs are directly hitting our pork industry. Uh, and, and, and I think we'll, we'll talk a little more about exports, but I got two slides here with a pie chart. And Dan, click to the advance to the animals and animal products to kind of put this in perspective nationwide. Um, the latest uh, full data from USDA, we had $176 billion in total receipts in, in animals and animal products. Uh, I think it's useful to just take a look at the size of the pie here. Cattle and calves are the biggest, poultry and eggs, dairy, hogs, uh, you know, that whole size in terms of understanding sort of what cash receipts are. The next one's crops. Uh, the total value of, of all uh, of our crops, just a little bit larger than livestock and animal products at $195 billion. But, you know, when we talk about the uh, uh, tariffs and retaliatory tariffs hitting soybeans particularly hard, uh, that's a that's a pretty big chunk of our uh, total crop receipts in the U.S. And you know, they're not the only ones being hit. If we looked at fruit and nuts, we are, we're in the midst of a boom in converting cropland to uh, almonds in California. We, we are the world's predominant exporter of almonds. Many of those go to China. And so these, the, as the tariffs expand, they're hitting all kinds of these products that we, we might not necessarily think about, but, uh, Anyway, again, just kind of putting this into context. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, kind of go go along with this argument of ne of this uh, sort of financial crisis we see in agriculture. Uh, if you take a look at this this chart from USDA shows gross farm income minus expenses and gets to kind of the idea of net farm income across all of agriculture. Uh, we went through some years, you know, really from the start of this in 2000 up to about 2013, there's an upward trend in net farm income. We get to the ethanol boom of, of uh, that really started in late 06, really provided a boom to uh, particularly farmers of corn and soybeans, uh, record high cattle prices. Uh, led to much higher net farm income and gross farm income in, in 13, 14, 15. Yet, you know, one of the things I've, I've often thought about agriculture and said is, you know, we've never had a demand that we couldn't oversupply. And when we oversupply, prices fall. And we're, we're really in, a, in a, a set of years of really falling, falling commodity prices, low prices really across the board and falling prices and you see net farm income falling uh, and and that's the big concern that we have more and more farmers in uh, really pretty tough financial straits uh, and and so I, I, I think this is a fair uh, look at across broadly speaking of all agriculture a, a situation of falling incomes so go ahead next slide uh, so let's let's jump to trade. I got a couple trade slides here. Uh, agriculture is a net exporter, meaning we export more value of agricultural products than we import. And the the trend for both exports and imports is growing. Uh, I, I think there's a couple of important points. You see that narrowing of the gap in 2018, where our imports are growing faster than our exports. I think there's some good common sense reasons for that, but uh, which I'll go into in a second, but uh, the trend is certainly higher. For exports, 
you know, I think to to understand where we are in agriculture, we are because of our productivity, we are more and more dependent on trade. We're more and more dependent on exports for our big uh, agricultural commodities. And and if we if we thought about livestock, for instance, we export about 23% of the pork we produce in the U.S. Uh, about 18% of the chicken, about 11% of our beef, our milk products. We export anywhere between about 15 to 20% of our dairy products every month. And if I went back 25 years, so as a livestock economist, if I went back in the day to 25 years ago, quite honestly, our exports were not big enough to matter. They just didn't, they weren't big enough to matter to what a, what a farmer, a rancher gets for his, for his livestock. And the world has changed. So we're more and more dependent on exports. So as we see these tariffs hit, what that means is if we're exporting almost a quarter of all the pork we produce and these tariffs make us less competitive and we export less, where's that pork going to go? That pork's going to stay here. And we'll see drastically lower pork prices, but also lower beef prices and chicken prices because all of us consumers, we get to go to the grocery store, we can choose. And price matters. So really, I think the story of exports is one that because we've been so productive, exports are a growth market for us. We often think of our U.S. market as being a uh, you know, really a, a, a mature market or a stable market, the growth is in the rest of the world. So we're more dependent on exports. Next slide, Dan. So I, I, I thought this was an interesting slide where we think about export share. I mentioned export share of our meat products, but take a look at cotton. We export more than 75% of our cotton. We export about 75% of the uh, tree nuts, the almonds, pecans, things like that. We produce, you know, rice. We grow rice in Texas, and we're heavily dependent on export markets. Wheat, for for decades, we've been major exporters of wheat, and that continues today. So it gives us a notion of, you know, kind of how dependent we are uh, on exports and trade for some of these crops. I think the next slide is uh, kind of an import share. And, and this is where, you know, when I showed that line chart of, of imports rising faster than our exports, uh, you know, I like to, one of the things kind of makes me chuckle about trade sometimes is, is if we looked at agricultural trade between Mexico and the U.S., we've actually switched from being a net exporter, meaning we're exporting more than we're importing, to now we're importing more than we're exporting. And that's just in the last couple of years. And the reason is guacamole. <laughs> which sort of sort of makes me chuckle. You know, you, you can't go to a restaurant without finding avocado there anymore. And we all like Mexican food, more and more avocados. We can't grow enough avocados to feed what we what we as consumers want, so we're importing. So look at this share of some of these imports, largely fruit and vegetables, uh, fish and shellfish, you know, if we had to rely on, on only U.S. grown coffee, we wouldn't get much coffee to drink. We we import almost all of it from somewhere else. Same with cocoa, spices. Uh, almost the, we're just unable in the U.S. to grow much of that. Our our environment, our climate, our land. That's not what we do well here, and those those crops don't grow here. So we import work, 100% dependent on that. We're more and more dependent on as we eat more fruits and vegetables, we import more of those. So I think this is kind of an instructive thing to kind of put some of our trade in context because I think a lot of us like a lot of these products on this list. And uh, as our diet, you know, if we, if we truly change sometimes what we eat to eat more fruits and vegetables, we're probably going to be importing that because we can't grow enough of that ourselves. So, you know, I think it's important to put that in context. Next slide, Dan. I think something's worth noting, and, you know, we I've mentioned a few changes. I, I think it's worth remembering that our agriculture changes all the time. And, and I just wrote a couple of, you know, just thinking briefly about some some ideas of where we can see that all around us. 
You know, it's just been in the last few years, our Texas dairy industry has moved from east of Dallas to Stephenville to the Texas Panhandle, and now nine of our 10 largest milk producing counties are in the Panhandle. Uh, that's a huge growing area and a, and a growing industry, and, and that represents a, that's a change. Uh, you know, Fredericksburg is over is overrun with wineries. Um, the whole trend towards more local foods. We see you know the growth of farmers markets. I, I I'm kind of a fan of H E B's ads where they they sh- they got a farmer and rancher on there who you know that's who they're buying their products from. And that connection to agriculture that consumers who may be living in cities see some of these things. And I, I think it creates a natural connection to us. Um, you know, boar goats and hair sheep, if you're into, uh, you know, sheep and goats, I mean, those are some huge changes in those industries. And, and because I'm a big fan of barbecue, I put barbecue on that list, too, because I think one of the really amazing trends in agriculture is – uh, at least in meat is the the boom in barbecue, and all over the country, you know, Texas style barbecue, and that means brisket, and we see that in uh, right in the wholesale beef prices, uh, in the brisket markets, uh, spilling over into other beef markets as well. So, you know, I think it's worth remembering. You know, we change all the time. We're a, you know, it's a dynamic industry that that you know an innovative industry that that changes. Go ahead, Dan. I, I put this in there just to highlight change because as a livestock economist, I wanted to put cows in there. Uh, and I, the data on the number of beef cows in the state goes back to 1920. And you can see in the 20s and 30s, we ran between 2 and 3 million uh, beef cows. All the growth in the U.S. economy post-World War II, uh, the boom in numbers up to 7 million in the mid-1970s and the decline since then. Much of that growth in the 50s and 60s relates to the growth in our Texas panhandle um, <clears throat> cattle feeding industry, where instead of the calves staying on the ranch and, and you know going to the beef market as yearlings or two years or older than that, um, they all go to feedlots and it let us run more cows. So we see our cow numbers rising. And then we see cow numbers declining as we've had changes in the economy since then, all the way from the from diet and health interests about red meat, chicken becoming much cheaper uh, than it used to be. Consumer trends, tastes and preferences, you know, the invention of a microwave oven, which allowed the invention of a breaded chicken sandwich you could pop in there, to chicken nuggets, all the way to wings today. Uh, really interacts with our cow numbers. And so we see uh, just a, I think it's a great example. And it's also a tremendous example of the drought in 2011, 12, 13, and the decline in cow numbers. And now we're rebuilding our herd. So, you know, I thought that was a nice little example just to kind of bring home a couple of those points. Go ahead, Dan. Um, I threw in a couple of things I think about in, in terms of technology things we might not have ever thought about or think about it as, you know, an agricultural change, but but freeways that allow us to move stuff faster, refrigerated trucks that allow us to move milk and milk products away. You know, it, it wasn't that long ago that you had to have the dairy right there by your little town to get milk, or everybody had a milk cow. And, you know, it's changes in terms of transportation, uh, even as, as far as that, that is, you know, has transformed agriculture. That last one down at the bottom, management technology, that can go all the way from, uh, you know, some of the integrated production systems we have to blockchain technology for record keeping. You know, I think we're seeing, you know, a whole bunch of changes. And I'd like to just, you know, say with that slide, you know, I think it's worth remembering the way we do it today is, you know, not going to be how we do it tomorrow. We we change, we innovate, and and we are in a dynamic industry. Yet the basics are still there: cows out on the range, um, feeding, uh, crops growing. You know, we plant in the spring, we harvest in the fall for most of our crops. Uh, wheat we plant in the fall and harvest in in the spring. But you know, the basics are still there. But still, it's a changing and dynamic industry. Next slide, Dan. So this is where I put in a little more. I, I, you know, I noticed in terms of path to the plate, we, you know, we're we're putting much of agriculture kind of in in a in a in a 
uh, cultural or social context. And it just so happens I'm I I re, I've I've always been a reader, and I think about uh, a, a, you know there's a there's a huge amount of like real fine literature and that that deals with Texas. Uh, many of them deal with you know there's agriculture scenes in there. And, you know, and, and so I thought I'd start with, you know, I threw out a little bit of a, maybe a starting, just bare, not even scratching the surface of some really great books for people who are readers um, on, I, I think probably all of these are on any kind of list you looked at about, you know, best uh, literature on the state. Uh, and, and all of these deal with agriculture. They got a setting in there. You know, some of you know I teach in our ag economics department. They get me to teach every fall our graduate course in ag policy, economics of government programs. And there's a couple of these I use in my reading list for even for graduate students because, um, you know, I think there's some interesting scenes in there. Uh, maybe, the, and, and this may go to my taste too, but, you know, if you ever saw the movie HUD, uh, that's that's the movie from Horseman Passed By by Larry McMurtry, and it's got a great scene in there when they find the the disease in the cow herd, and the the government officials show up, and they gotta they have to kill all the old guys' cattle uh, to stop the spread of the disease. You know, we deal with the exact same things today in in uh, in agriculture. Worries about African swine fever in in hogs. Uh, foot and mouth disease, all of these things. There's a scene from these, you know, what are really pretty good books. Uh, Goodbye to a River, if you haven't read that, that's about, you know, John Graves takes a canoe trip down the down the Brazos before he gets da dammed up. Uh, so, you know, I thought I'd scratch the surface there if, you know, as we, as we think about where agriculture fits in a broader context. Um, I think that's pretty interesting. And if we look at this, you know, just thinking about it, Pulling all this back together, we're, we're going through a pretty difficult economy for production agriculture right now, yet our agriculture is really fully entwined throughout our economy. And so that really sort of wraps up all of my comments on, you know, kind of fitting agriculture into the context of the economy. I guess we always put our contact stuff on there. So, <laughs> so anyway, whatever you want to use for the last slide is good enough for me, Dan. Uh, do we have some time for questions? Hope I didn't yak too long. Yeah, let's go. You, you know, you actually answered the question that I had as far as cash receipts. You, did, you know, just the multiplying of factor that agriculture has in our economy. Oh, and and Dan, let me go back to that. The um, on that, you know, you asked that question about cash receipts and and contribution to gross domestic product. That that contribution part is sort of a you know, a value added notion. So um, in the analysis, we would we take in the value of the products we sell minus the cost it takes to produce them. Uh, and and so what 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 is each step of the process adding to our economy? What value the value adding part? So um, yeah, I think that's a great question, and I'm glad I sort of answered it. <laughs> Good. Good. You bet you did. You did great. So, um, any questions, Julie? Do you see anything come across chat? And then we'll just open if you want to unmute your mic. Um, Dan, there's nothing in the chat box as of now. Okay. I usually take that as a good sign. <laughs> yeah. That's great. So, I mean, Ken, is, if anybody's having trouble unmuting their mic, let me know, okay? So, um, yeah, so we're seeing from Courtney and Cameron, so everybody's saying thank you for your presentation <laughs> yeah, in the chat box. So, uh, that's great. Appreciate, uh, Dave, you doing, doing this, because my, my main goal, again, was for all of us to understand, including me. I mean, there's some things that I learned about imports and exports, how they're changing over time. And also I had a, a question about, you know, how the tariffs were impacting that and, you know, near term versus long term. Do you have any thoughts about that as far as to the current tariffs? Because we, we get asked that question quite a bit. Yeah. So, um, you I think the tariffs, I think one of the things is because so many of these things are, are changing so quickly and 
and so much of it is you put a tariff on somebody, they retaliate, and it, it's just a, it, it just adds even more uncertainty to uh, to our crop markets, our livestock markets. It adds more price volatility. It just adds a lot more uncertainty. You know, one of the interesting things in the latest round of that when we last week when we announced more tariffs on China, on Chinese products, they announced their what they were going to raise the tariff on in retaliation. Uh, if you dug down into the codes, there was there was a real interesting one for agriculture, Be, and, it, and it's this is a this is a one most of us would overlook. And that is casings. So anybody who likes to go to a restaurant or a barbecue place that's got sausage, um, casings are what we stuff the sausage in. And what happens is you want to, you know, most places want to use natural casings, which come from hogs and sheep. And we, what happens is we export those to China. They're processed, they're clean, they're developed, and then we import them back. And we sell them to sausage makers. And the tariff went from something like 25% to 47%. So every once in a while, I get asked to go talk to uh, uh, Dr. Griffin. Davey Griffin gets me to talk with the Texas Association of Meat Processors. And when I was visiting with them last fall, one, the one thing that they wanted me to talk about is what on earth is happening in the casings markets because so many of those guys are sausage makers. And we don't think about that, but that's a that's a major cost that all of us face when we go to a at least when I go to the kinds of restaurants I like, <laughs> I guess I'm sort of a sausage fan. Uh, that's one that that's one that hits me, and but it's not one we think about. It's not corn and soybeans or or the big stuff. But there's a lot of these small items that matter a bunch, I think, to us, and and we're going to see the impacts of those on our on our meat processors, our, you know, sausage makers, and, and we're going to see, eventually we're going to see that get on down to us as consumers too. David, I have a question about that. Um, why is it that we export that out? Do we just not have the facilities to clean those casings or what, what's the history yeah, behind that? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's one where they can do it cheaper than we can, even with ch shipping it over there and bringing it back. Um there's a lot of, of industries like that uh, where, you know, there are, other, there are places in the rest of the world that, that, that can do just, just plain do it more economically than we can, cheaper than we can. Uh, and casings is one of those. Another good one is hides. The, the tanning industry for leather, you know, that's a, that's a pretty messy industry too. A lot of that, and, and there are, you know, places in China and Asia that, they can do. They can make leather a lot uh, cheaper than we can. We export hides. They go to tanneries over there in those other countries. They're turned into a, to leather. We import the leather back, and we make finished goods out of it. In some cases, they make the finished goods, whether it's uh, leather car seats or whatever. Um, the hides industry, the leather industry, is another one of those where, you know, it's just been cheaper, more economical to do it somewhere else than to do it here. And, and you know, I think both of those are good examples of that. So, a lot, uh, David, a lot of that is, I guess, probably labor as well as the environmental issues with, with tanning. But Yeah, labor's, you know, I think for some of those, labor is sort of the, that was the first thing that moved um, uh, a lot of those kinds of things. Even, even cotton mill, you know, milling, uh, stuff like cotton that we had so many mills in the southeast, the mills all left. Labor costs were much cheaper other places. Uh, for something like tanneries, uh, there are, you know, we, it's it's a pretty messy business, and there's environmental regulations, and, and that, that helped move uh, a lot of tanneries to other countries as well. Uh, and, you know, they produce it cheaper than we do here. And so, yeah, I think, I think both of those are good reasons or good you know, fundamental reasons why those industries have left. So you know, I was talking to um, a, a really uh, long, I guess probably 50-year peach grower in Fredericksburg area, and he said that they're probably going to go out of business just because they cannot get the labor to come in and, and do the, you know, the picking and the other, other things that are need, needed to be done to, for those fruit trees. Uh, 
I, you know, that's a good point. Um, I, I sort of just left labor out, you know, <laughs> in terms of time. But so many of our fruits and vegetables, uh, our livestock, our dairy industry, um, we, re, you know, they're labor intensive. And our labor issues, uh, which gets us right into immigration, uh, you know, those are big deals. And, and we think about our, whether it's meat packing or dairy, those are, or, or cattle feedlots, the kind of labor we have there are, you know, every day, all year long, 365 day labor. Um, we look at some of the fruits and vegetables, it's very much seasonal. Um, so it becomes, and, and that becomes an issue in some of the immigration debates going on about uh, types of visas, types of work, types of jobs. Uh, we have a labor shortage across agriculture across the whole U.S. And, you know, really, so I've, I've had the chance to do some labor uh, economics work for the dairy industry. It's been pretty interesting, but, you know, we often think of agriculture has been an entry-level job for new immigrants. They get here, uh, they work in agriculture, but there are higher paying jobs in town, uh, construction, things like that. And, and so, uh, we have the same labor issues in, in construction and places where there's labor shortages uh, to, you know, fuel the building boom we got in College Station anyway. <laughs> yeah, a lot, of, a lot of construction and you know, I guess I forgot about the seasonality issues with agriculture. Hiring somebody for just a few, you know, three months or six months period of time. And and places like in you know in California or in the West where we have, uh, you may have a, a whole, whole lot of different fruit and vegetable crops. A lot of the labor moves with the crop as it's, as, as they're finished in one area, they move to another area where the, the next type of crop is being harvested. And so it spreads out the job longer, but you are, you're, you have to be very mobile to move to where the next crop is, is, is ready to harvest. So, you know, we're, I think we're facing labor issues, you know, across the whole economy. Does anybody else have questions? Uh, Jim Ann That's did, a good uh, question. Yeah, Jim Ann asked if the slides were going to be av available, and the answer is yes. So this presentation, I have a PDF version that I will put on the Champion website. It'll be under trainings, and it'll be under dated uh, for this date for the WebEx. Um, and I guess we could get a get the PowerPoint too if you if that's I can send you that one too whenever okay, Dan yeah, if yeah, that's useful either a link to a Dropbox or wherever because I I don't it's like seventeen or twelve megabytes so yeah it's pretty big but not not relatively compared to a lot of mine there it's actually not <laughs> <laughs> that's great so um, any other questions. Somebody has before we go on to talking about a little bit about the what's coming up next. Well, Dan, let me say real fast, thank you very much for inviting me and having me on with this. I, I appreciate the opportunity and and glad to do it. And I find this stuff pretty interesting myself. So thank you very much. Well, Drew and Kathy are they all wrote say, Hey, you did great today. So thank oh, you. Oh, thanks. You bet. All right. So let's continue to uh discuss uh, as we go from there. A lot of the information that uh, David just presented will go into some of the what I'll be presenting today. Um, and But before we do that, let's go ahead and let's talk a little bit about what's going to happen coming up June 26th through the 20, 27th. So let's uh, go to that, see if I can share this. Okay. All right, let's give it a shot here. point. All right. So, hey, Julie, can you see this? Yes, sir, I can. All right. So, what I, this is a tentative outline of the program that we've been working on. So, working with Julie and also working with the leadership up in District 1 and District um, <clears throat> District 2 and the re, re, RPLs up there. And, and actually, Danny and Angela are, are having a significant uh, impact in trying to get this together. But um, so we've been able to, as you look at the program, we're going to the panhandle to look at that agriculture, um, some really neat things that happen up there. And so we'll be focusing on the first day. If you look, we'd like for everybody to get their 
uh, ready to start at one o'clock at the center at the uh, South Plains Center Research Extension Center there, District 2. Uh, and it will be in that area for the entire day. We'll be doing cotton. We'll be working on fiber and uh, oh, textiles. Then we'll also be working on you know, fruit and vegetables, some of the research trials that are going up there, and then also be doing viticulture while we're up there as well. And uh, then we'll have dinner that evening, and then that night we'll stay overnight at the Overton Hotel. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a second. And then on the 27th, we'll uh, check out of the hotel. So we will leave that hotel on the 27th. We'll meet at the South Plains Center. We will um, uh, load in vans, and we will start heading towards the Hereford area and doing dairies and cavernous and a milling uh, area up there, and then slowly working our way over to Canyon. And then in Canyon, we'll be talking with the cattle feeder industry, and then also um, get to see the brand new facility that uh, West Texas A&M University has, has built, and talk about some of the research that they are doing uh, with respect to agriculture, path to the plate oriented programs. Um, and then we'll overnight there at the Holiday Inn Express, and then the next morning we'll load in vans. You notice really early on both days, um, we're going to head down to Wrangler Feed Yard with a goal of trying to get two stops in that day. We'll go to Wrangler Feed Yard, and then we'll go to um, Halfway, Texas, where we have a research center that does work on irrigation and new technologies and crop, crop production. And then we'll finally uh, head south. It's about 45 minutes from there to the airport. So we'll drop people off at the airport and then take people to the South Bladen Center. So that's an overview. We will be traveling by vans. So, and what I've uh, arranged for is for us to, as we're coming on the 25th, as early as 2 o'clock, if you're flying in, we'll be able to pick you up uh, at the airport. We'll have people there. You just need to please send us your uh, flight information so we can come and get you and bring you to the airport, uh, to the hotel. Hotel is um, just a, probably about five minutes from the from the airport, maybe 10 minutes at the most. It's also on the T uh, Texas Tech campus, so there, and there are a lot of places to eat uh, in the area of the hotel. Um, and so we'll we'll kind of camp out at the Overton for those uh, 25th. Uh, my student Corey will be there to help help you transport. We can give you rides other places as well on the 25th if you need to do other things in the area. So uh, if you're driving on your own, that's great. And uh, please you know, just park there and then meet us at the center on the next day, which we will start at 1 o'clock. So you, there are some flights that actually get in at Lubbock at 12.50, as I looked at them, saying you're welcome to get on those flights that will get you in as late as that. I realize that they're, you know, that's kind of playing a little close as far as you know, all the delays and issues that can happen, particularly this time of year in Texas. But um, you know, that, I understand if that happens, but um, you know, we can get you to our meetings at one, because you know, the, the airport is like five minutes. Uh, in the other direction from the center, so it's uh, almost like the next exit down. So they're very close together. You can see the airport from the center, um, and then so we'll go back, uh, you know, and travel that next day on the 27th. So we'll meet and stay in the area on the 26th, meet on the 27th, and on the 28th we'll get you back to the airport so you can catch a two o'clock flight. Um, and looking at it, there's some two o'clock flights that get you back to your homes at a reasonable hour. The two places that we we have arranged a book uh, at Room Block is the uh, Overton Hotel in Lubbock, and we have uh, I've been able to expand that. Thank you for reminding me to do that. Some of you, and I, I really I need you guys to help me catch things that I'm not catching. So I appreciate that. I, anytime you have a question or a comment or a change that you think we ought to do, I'm definitely open to that. Because um, this is your tour, and I know some of you know these areas better than I do, so it would help. You know, I, I appreciate your help when we do that. Then, in addition to that, uh, so the Overton on the 25th through the 26th, or extend that room block to the 25th, and then the 27th, uh, you'll need to call in on both of these, and that 27th is at the Holiday Inn Express. So, I guess I'll open it up to any questions about that before we continue uh, with the. 
presentation. So anybody write something in the chat, Julie, or anything I need to think about or we need to talk about? Uh, no, just uh, Courtney made the, sure that everyone knew that if you wanted to eat at Spanky's, you can walk there from the Overton, so that's a great thing to know. <laughs> Oh, really? So you have to tell me more about Spanky's. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so let's all plan to eat there for dinner on the 25th, okay? <laughs> yeah, a lot of other restaurants, yeah, that's for sure, <clears throat> in in that area. So it's it's a good area to be in. It's a really nice hotel. We will have breakfast. They 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 do not eat breakfast at the hotel. We will bring you breakfast at the center. Is that hotel whole bre you know, breakfast about 15 bucks. And I think I can probably do as good a job uh, by just providing something, uh, something really nice. I hope at the center uh, as we before we get on the vans. Okay. All right, cheese sticks. All right, way to go, Jesse. I appreciate that recommendation. That's great. All right, so uh, Julie, just keep watching as you go through there for both comments and questions on that, as well as what we're going to discuss next. So let's go back to the presentation. So finally working through some of the technical issues. I apologize, Dave, for all of that, how that worked out. Seems like WebEx always has something going on. Let's hope that it continues to uh, work like it's been working. So, you know, I decided to uh, really talk about some, you know, what, what this is, is just a combination of how we work with people in our audiences and what are some of the ways that our audiences think about, the, you know, their, what I would call their worldview. And then also in that whole context, address some maybe hot topics as we go through, just as some examples. Um, to talk about as we think about people's worldview. I drive my kids crazy because after we go to a movie, I ask them, okay, what was the worldview of that movie? So you know, as you talk about the worldview, you know, first of all, why is that important for us as extension people? Well, every one of these people that you see in this picture have a worldview, and that worldview is based off of many different things that have either occurred in their life, the families that they grow up in. Um, and so they actually all, may all come at food and agriculture and health from a totally, as we know in extension, from a totally different standpoint. And so that's important to, uh, to think about as we go to any audience that we're going to talk to. You know, so a worldview is the overall perspective from one which one sees and interprets the world. A collection of beliefs about life and the universe, health, Universal held belief uh, and the universe held by an individual or a group. So, you know, here we have Temple Grandin talking to a group of students. And so, when you're here at Texas A&M University, you really do see a wide range of worldviews, even about agriculture within the agricultural department. And that's because many of them come from an urban and suburban background. Seventy percent of the students in the Department of Animal Science come from an urban and suburban background. Many of them, uh, you know, have never had any interaction with real agriculture. They're there because they, you know, they love pets or they love horses or they want to be a vet. And they luck, you know, very fortunate for us to get them because we're able to help, you know, in, uh, just kind of show them from a scientific standpoint why we do what we do in agriculture. And maybe uh, shapes in some aspects the world view, maybe not intentionally, but indirectly in many ways. Uh, the worldview that these students may have as they go out of college. So what is a worldview? And so as you look at agriculture, you know, I, I use this slide, next few slides, in a class that I teach uh, on animal welfare. And, uh, but, you know, when you look at agriculture as, as a whole, there really is a, kind of a battle of worldviews about how people think about agriculture. And there's a lot of gradation in these worldviews, but you may have heard me talk about this before, but you know I, I see that from a you know, majority of agriculturalists, farmers and ranchers across the state of Texas that I've interacted with for over 34 years now, I would put them in a category of having a stewardship mindset. 
And if you look at actually the definition of husbandry or stewardship by the uh, Veterinary Medical Association, it's the conducting, supervising, or managing of something, especially the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. That when you think about land, when you think about water, when you think about the farm, the ranch, the individual enterprise, when you think about the animals, uh, they really feel like those, those have been resources that have been entrusted to their care. Now, there's another worldview that people can have towards agriculture, and I don't see that very often. And many times, uh, people who are uh, want to kind of portray a, a different worldview, they would try to paint agriculturalists in an exploitation kind of worldview, where all we're doing is we're taking, taking, and taking, and never really giving, and never having a, you know, a thought about the long-term implications of what we're doing. So exploitation is the use of someone or something in an unjust or cruel manner, or generally as a means to one's end. So when in agriculture, there, uh, in the animal side, there's actually another kind of worldview that uh, is presented, and that uh, where the stewardship, exploitation of animals, and, and most people would say, you know, uh, the majority of people in the in the United States through surveys have shown that, you know, if it's the stewardship route, they're they're fine with um, using animal products. Um, if it's exploitation, then that's, you know, that draws the line. They don't want to go down that road. But there is also another group that would, from the animal standpoint, that would say that, uh, you know, there's an equality, that animals, humans, and animals are exactly the same. Uh, Ingrid Newkirk, in a uh, quote out of the Washingtonian magazine in August of 18, uh, 1986, she made this statement. She is the founder of PETA. And she made a statement that says, there's no rational basis for saying that a human being has special rights. A rat is a pig, is a dog is a boy, they're all animals. So we're basically saying they're all the same and no one else has a you know, higher order than another. So what is the worldview of a rancher? You know, that's a question that we all ought to kind of look at. So I, I, I really actually challenge ranchers to ask them, maybe not in the context of saying, what is your worldview, but to help them understand that, you know, if they do these production practices, for example, beef quality assurance, that it will be in the best interest of the animals as well as to the people that are going to consume those foods as well as to the rancher themselves. Because when you do things right, then what happens is, is that the animals are happier and healthier and will produce better. You know, so what is the, you know, of the worldview of this farmer? Well, you see his little boy climbing up in the tractor. And most farmers and ranchers, they want to be able to have a livelihood for today, but their ultimate goal is a livelihood not just for them, but for future generations. And so they know that if that's going to happen, they have to really care for the land, water, resources, animals that they have in an entrusting kind of way, as we've talked about in the stewardship mindset, so that they can pass that off to the next generation. And they can experience the same things that, that that farmer experienced. So stewardship, I believe, is what most and, and, and most people in agriculture in Texas and the United States, that's kind of the, the framework that they come from. So where did that come from? Where did stewardship come from? Well, it came from uh, a Judeo-Christian underpinnings that we have within our country. You know, basically, if you look through the book of Genesis, and again, this is not a Bible study, but it just really, you know, I like to share with people where does the worldview that we come from, you know, where was that established? And that this is also why the majority is 70, you know, 73% say it's okay to use uh, food products from animals, uh, use fiber from animals, if those animals have been treated humanely. And uh, so, you know, basically, if you look at that, it puts man at a different position in the world than animals. The first person to use, in Genesis 3, we see that the first one to use animals was God himself. And then actually, Genesis 9, after the flood, it talks about how, you know, you can eat everything that moves. And so it kind of gives it from that standpoint. And then, you know, it talks about, in even in the New Testament, the same thing. You know, how much, how important sheep are, in this case, in Matthew 12, but man is more important than a sheep. So, you know, how important it is to care. And then Proverbs 12, 20, uh, 10, which is the book of wisdom, talks about a righteous man carries for the needs of his animals. So this is the underpinning 
of where I think that stewardship has come from. So if we look at kind of where we are in today's uh, society, we're moving into what we call a postmodern worldview. And really, you know, there's a lot said here in this text, but it really is questioning the norm. So just because it has always been that way, is always that way, you know, should it be that way? And I think it's always good to question the norm. That's for sure. Um, so let's kind of read through here. It says, while encompassing a wide variety of approaches, postmodernism is generally defined as an attitude of skepticism, irony, rejection, uh, the meta narratives, uh, the ideology of modernism. Okay, that's what was before. Often called into question during assumptions of enlightenment rationality. Consequently, common targets of postmodern critiques include universalist notions of objective reality, morality, truth, human nature, reason, language, and social progress. And so, you know, why it is good to you know, always look at what we are doing, making sure what we're doing right. I think we've made some changes, some good changes based off of that. Uh, but it seems like today everything is questioned and basically turned everything on its head and saying, if it was that way, it's almost gone to the point where if it is, whatever the way it was is not good. Okay, and so we've got to do it different. And, and so we kind of go down that road sometimes and you have to be careful in, in doing that. So here, I think it's important for us to really see this postmodern worldview and, and have a good understanding of who we're working with in, in, in extension. And this, what I'm saying in all of this has nothing to do with what people's worldview, good, bad. I'm just trying to explain why I think it is the way that it is. So what is your, this is one, um, it's actually a blogger in the UK, or actually in Europe, in Copenhagen. Uh, he's the founder of a group that has a blog. He is uh, it's called The Future is Vegan. And so they, I just asked him a question. What's your opinion on keeping pets? So if the animals have been rescued from a cruel fate, then I think it's okay. But by buying another individual for companionship is, in my view, no better than buying them for entertainment purposes or for food. I think it's fine to get a dog from a pound, but not from a breeder. Breeding is never in the interest of the animal. And so it's just nothing wrong or right with that thought. In, in my, you know, but the key is, is what when you think about you see different people have different ways of thinking about things. Now, there are some absolute truths. I believe that. Um, and, but as you look at postmodern, they, they don't necessarily believe in absolute truths. So where is the overall, you know, that was just one individual, but what is the overall kind of temperature or pulse in the United States with respect to food and agriculture? And so this is from a uh, consumer study that was done by the Center of Food Integrity. And in the Center of Food Integrity, they asked several questions. They asked them on a scale of one to, to uh, eight. And if you look at this chart, you'll see it says 14%, 61%, 25%. Well, the, the part that says 21, 5%, that would be people that would say they strongly agree with the statement, whatever that statement was. In this case, it is, I trust today's food system. So 25% of the people uh, in that survey said, Yes, I trust today, strongly agree with I trust today's food system. 61% moderately agree, and 14% disagree with that statement, or have a low level of agreement. And what's interesting is uh, this is 2018 reported, and so only 25% strongly agreed, and in the year before it was 37%. And if they asked them this question, well, is, is the food system on the right track, wrong track, or are you unsure? And there's a lot of unsure people out there. Right track, 42% said yes, which is, is, is good. And wrong track, 24%, 35% uh, are unsure. So there's a lot of people that just don't know necessarily what to think about it. Some other things that we got out of that, you know, asked the question about I am, this is a statement, I am totally confident in the safety of the food that I eat. And 33% strongly agreed with that statement, again, compared to 47% that strongly agreed with that statement the year before. And uh, only one and two trust food produced in the United States more than food outside the United States. That was kind of surprising to me. The other thing uh, that you'll see over here in the blue, it says big is bad. 
And so there is an idea that uh, bad, that, that bigger farms are bad and smaller farms are good. And uh, I wish I'd asked David about uh, the farm systems. A lot of times the reason that people have gotten bigger and bigger is because that's what they, has been required just to be able to provide for their families. And so while at one time you might have needed 100 head of cattle, now you need at least 500 to 1,000 head of cattle. Uh, on a cow-calf basis just to be able to provide for your family. So, you know, and so it gives you an idea, you know, if it, they, they think small is better than, than big. So here's going, going to the treatment of animals. You know, if farm animals are treated decently and humanely have no problem consuming meat, milk, or eggs. And 61% of the people strongly agreed with that statement. And, and so that shows you in 34, when you add that together, that's 95% of the people said that they either somewhat moderately agree or strongly agree with that statement. Uh, if you look at what's in red there, it says trust alert. Well, there's a trust issue because only 25% believe U.S. meat is derived from humanely treated animals. So it shows some of the things that we're going to going through. U.S. farmers take good care of the environment. So 30% strongly agree compared to 42%. So when you put that, at least 90%, at least somewhat agree or moderately agree with that statement. Uh, and there's 80% more um, that people that are concerned this year than they were last year about climate change. So in the, in the Center for Food Integrity, they split people into some groups as far as how they look at truth and what's really important to them uh, as they look at statements about food. So let's kind of go through. So we have all the way from scientific, philosopher, uh, we'll explain some of these terms here in a minute, follower, wishful thinker, existential, uh, existentialist. So we're going from, if you look below that picture of scientists, it says objective and grounded and evidence-based science, nothing more or less. And then you have this middle road, objective and subjective, seeks guidance from trusted authorities. Well, in my mind, that's you. You're a trusted authority, and you are building trust, as I've told you many times, every single day. That's what, why you make Extension unique. That's what makes you, uh, from a county agent standpoint, you know, essential to the, to the mission uh, of AgriLife Extension and the mission of just trying to help consumers live a better, higher quality life. And then we have um, existentialists, you know, coincides with desires, beliefs, what feels true. So they're more on just feeling. So this, I thought this was an interesting part. So here we have the different breakout again. And you'll see the percent of uh, the people that they surveyed, what, where they fell into the group uh, as far as population-wise. And um, as you go through, you see the majority of people are followers, what they would call a follower. So let's look at uh, the gray writing above that and kind of help understand what uh, these things, who they listen to and what's important to them. So on the scientific side, drive standards of scientific claim, but unable to simplify content and uh, relate to mainstream consumers. Influence extends only as far as philosophers. So scientific can really only impact philosophers is what they're saying. The philosophers uh, they're able to take that scientific information, they boil it down. This is what extension agents do every single day, so you're good at it. And they actually then help the, feel, uh, the feeler or the follower, or excuse me, in this case the follower, basically understand the science, okay, and uh, give them the advice that you know, will help them ha hopefully have a better life. So in this, in my mind, you have you know, an influence on, you know, 35% of the people. What we always do, though, is we kind of get kind of tied down with the wishful thinkers and the, and the feelers, the existentialists, because they also have a significant voice. Wishful thinkers, you know, they trust big sweeping claims from official or unofficial sources. They uh, under undermine credibility by exaggerating the impact of a particular food or practice. And this happens all the time. You'll see in you know, the exaggeration, we'll use an example here in a little bit, just a total exaggeration of, of what a one food does to your health. 
either positive or negative. And then uh, existentialist who feels morally superior and prefers information that validates their existing beliefs about food and health. Uh, too politically charged, with alien, uh, which alienate them from mainstream culture. So I uh, see as we get through here, we need to wor work with those and identify those who really are looking for the best source of information and some good advice and fill that need and not get necessarily worn down by, by people that really just are, are not really even following in that direction. Hopefully that kind of gives you an idea uh, of some, I thought, some interesting information that came out of that particular study. One, one last part that came out of that study that I have talked about when I did the trainings that I always want to continue to revisit and also why I believe you are so important in the path to the plate is, um, you know, this is called the trust model. This is something that the uh, Center for Food Integrity constructed. Other people may have constructed it, but they're, they're the first people I saw it with back uh, about seven years ago. And they have broken down into the trust and that people um, look and build trust based off of their confidence, competence, and influential uh, others. So confidence is shared values and ethics. So do you have shared values and ethics with that person? That builds trust. Competence. Do you have the information? Do you have the scientific information to, to be able to answer that person's que question in a credible manner? And then influence of others. That's family, friends, and credentialed individuals. And what we found out is, if you notice, the confidence is three to five times bigger than the other two circles because they found it to be the most important. So. Before we can give people information, we have to have that trust. And again, you are that trusted individual that's in the county every day working with people. And you know, we're here, we're, we're providing a service, trying to help as much as we can. Um, so then we've got, uh, so if they do trust, this also will go into as we go through what agriculture can do. If we do, if agriculture gains trust, then they give you social license to operate in the way that you want to that you feel is the best for that environment. And uh, so they give you the social license and the freedom to operate. If they don't trust you, then there's all sorts of government controls that will be put in place to make sure that you're doing what you're doing, what you should do. And so that's, uh, there, there is a battle for that trust. And that goes back to the battle of worldviews. Because there are groups that their whole goal is, is to try to say you cannot trust modern agriculture or to what what is traditionally happening now and and there's no doubt as an agricultural industry there are improvements that need to be made but from texas a m university standpoint as well as agri-life extension research we are working daily with those ranchers farmers food processors to do put the best practices in place to make sure that that happens so i'd like to you know, as we finish up and just kind of talk about you know, using a recent report as um, as a kind of an example to talk through. Uh, you may have seen it. It's called the Lancet Commission. Eat Lancet. Many people just refer to it as that. It is a commission. Now, the commission is kind of loosely held because it is not a commission from uh, the World Health Organization. It is a self-developed uh, commission. Uh, headed by uh, uh, Dr. Willett out of uh, Harvard, and he put together a group of scientists to look at the healthy diets of people and try to put out what he's calling the healthy diet uh, and sustainable food systems. And looking at the current system and saying, oh, we need to do this instead. And that's really where that has come from. Now, it's important to, to basically, again, worldview. So let's talk about my worldview. Well. All of you know that I'm an extension meat specialist. Let's just be real about that. I've studied meat for 34 years plus. You know, if you go back to the grad school, it's 40 years. And so does that, and I do eat meat. So I'm, you know, I eat meat. I have no problem with vegetarianism or veganism. I totally support people that make that choice. No problem at all. I, I, I do want to help them, help them understand if you take animal products out of your diet, then these are things that you have to do to make sure that you will live a healthy, long life that will have maintain a high quality, uh, high quality of life. 
because there are certain things that you have to do. Um, you know, it, it really when, when people do take certain things out of their diets and they don't add nutrients or minerals or vitamins back into them that that food had, then that can create some significant issues. Uh, and so, for example, most uh, uh, Stanford University did a study that said a, ma a large majority of vegetarians are vitamin B def or B12 deficient and have a, another significant portion are iron deficient. So that is just replacing that. And of course, as extension uh, agents, uh, family and community health, specifically Healthy Texas, you're helping people understand how they can do that. On the other side, though, this it, it's important to understand that this particular commission was funded by an animal rights activist group, as well as another group that uh, promotes uh, a um, Garden of Eden diet, which again is a plant-based diet, actually has developed a company that sells those plant-based products. Um, and so um, most people don't necessarily see that. They see this Eat, Eat, Eat Lancet report, which is out of the journal, Lancet Journal, which has all sorts of scientific information, all, you know, all peer-reviewed, quote. And so, but we have to understand that you know, and 80 percent of the people on the commission are either vegetarians or vegans. So, again, when you look at that, um, I'm not downplaying what they, their findings, but I'm saying, they, again, worldviews. So, my come at it from a worldview, they come at it from a worldview. I'm just being honest. So, in a review of East Lansing, again, talking about those worldviews, you know, they, they put together a diet. This is directly out of their, their report. This is what you should eat on a daily basis as you go down through here and you'll see a large proportion of this is if we put it in a bar chart form a large proportion of this is rice wheat and corn so 32 percent of at least the calories come from that and if you look at on uh, sweeteners five percent um, if you come down tree nuts six percent uh, i think the next the biggest dairy item that you see if you look at the very bottom of this pie chart you'll see the animal food products and those are those very small chart, except for dairy, which is 6%. And, uh, you know, from our standpoint, we promote more fruits and vegetables. In reality, uh, this particular diet that they have put forth actually is, is low in fruits and vegetables, particularly given the recommendations that we put forth uh, for, within AgriLife Extension. So a uh, registered dietitian and a, a PhD, Dr. Har uh, Haircomb, you know, she has looked at the numbers using USDA, uh, the healthy reference diets that uh, Eat Lancet put together. She put that in a USDA calculator for a uh, adult male 2,000 calorie diet and came and determined that uh, if we ate according to the recommendations of Eat Lancet, those people would be deficient in vitamin B12, retinol, vitamin D, vitamin K, sodium, potassium, calcium, iron, omega-3 fatty acids. And as we know across the world, when we talk about undernutrition, uh, the majority of that is either uh, protein, iron, or, or vitamin A is another large one of those if you look at that. And so each one of these would actually not address that issue. The people that would eat this particular diet would actually have some additional amino or amino acid deficiencies in their diet as well as iron deficiency. So we know that animal food products are nutrient dense foods that have all sorts of nutrients and in some cases have nutrients that are either don't exist in plant foods like vitamin B12 for example uh, or exist in a much more readily absorbable fashion than they do in plant foods. For example, iron and zinc. Uh, the, the zinc in meat products is three times as absorbable and bioavailable to humans than plant zinc. So we can't just look at, you know, they have exactly the same amount, milligrams of zinc in them. We actually almost have to multiply the plant times three. And there are some things within plants that help bond or, or uh, or uh, hold on to some of these other minerals that don't allow them to be part and uh, used in our in our bodies. Uh, one thing again that uh, we're going to go through some other things as we look at the Eat Lancet report. 
So here we have a list of amino acids, and we see that what ends up happening is that cattle are actually, a, for example, on all livestock, and fish as well, and chicken. They're all what we call nutrient accumulators. For example, they'll take the uh, protein that they find in corn, they'll add to that the protein that they get out of grasses, as well as other byproducts. They'll incorporate that, and they'll actually, the, the beef itself will be much higher in all of these essential amino acids that you see listed here. And in fact, where they would be deficient if we just ate corn, now they are more than what we need from an amino acid standpoint that we need every single day in our diet if we ate the beef. So that is a nutrient accumulation uh, in those animals. And actually, a really good example of that uh, is, has been recently uh, come out in some of these um, plant-based uh, burger uh, alternatives. And I've tasted some. I went to and ate an Impossible Burger at um, oh, uh, oh, Hop, Hop Daddy's down here in College Station. It was pretty good. Um, it tasted a little bit different, but it was so much better than the plant alternatives that I've had in the past. So it was it was pretty good. And um, and I looked at uh, the Impossible Burger. Of course, Wa uh, Wa Whopper Burger King is doing a test market in Chicago, in St. Louis area, with that. But I looked at the um, oh, ingredient list for both regular ground beef. So if you look to ground beef, the ingredient list is beef. If you looked at Impossible Burger, this is off of their website. This is the ingredient label. So and my point here is that beef and chicken and all are actually nutrient accumulators where they're putting a, a whole host of nutrients into one package. Again, nothing wrong with the alternative beef product. People do need to understand that it is a water is first. Well, beef is water first. Beef is 70% water, so that's not a big deal. But uh, when you, you have to list water as, as the first ingredient in this, and then coconut oil is the third ingredient in the list of this particular food. And so, again, nothing wrong with eating that, nothing wrong with producing that. It just, I think people ought to understand that you know, beef cattle, as well as all the other animal foods, are actually accumulators of those nutrients. Um, if we look at just some overall within East Lancet report, and again, I'm trying to help you with some hot topic issues and just kind of think through some of them. Um, this is some rebuttal, not just from me, but from scientists that I've gone through, uh, through the looking at uh, both the uh, American Animal Science Association as, uh, as well as some researchers at UC, UC Davis and what they have put forward. And they basically say that, um, well, it ignores the nutritional benefits of meat. Well, we already talked about that. It also greatly exaggerates the negative health outcomes. If you look at the report itself, the commission report, it's almost exclusively epidemiological research and very little, if any, clinical trial research. And in fact, uh, some of the researchers have said there is no clinical research, clinical research that would actually direct, um, uh, direct um, animal products to uh, certain health issues. Epidemiological, yes, but not actually where they've seen uh, actually heart attacks. They might see different blood chemistry, but they don't actually trace them back to specific heart attacks and that specific food. It's very difficult to even do that clinical trial because of genetic differences, because of other lifestyle differences. Epidemiological research tried to take those things into consideration, but let me kind of give you an example of an epidemiological research that could you could have just kind of paints the picture so um, what and this was explained to me uh, by a research scientist so you know in the summer they've determined that consuming ice cream it leads to increased drowning now that may just sound just totally ridiculous and it is but so there is a relationship so this is causation versus correlation. So a correlation between increased drowning and the consumption of ice cream. Well, what happens? Well, during the summer, the temperature goes up. When temperature goes up, people go to the pool more often and people consume more ice cream at the same time because it's hot. 
So is there a really a causation? Absolutely not, but there is a correlation. You can correlate just about anything with something. And so again, we have to be really careful when we're just when we're making claims or making recommendations just strictly off of epidemiological research. All right, so and then let's kind of so again, um, let's look at the environmental standpoint as we go through here. So it, 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 the study actually, and this is something I used to think is that dirt was dirt until I took crop science in, in college and took soil science in college. And I determined that, wow, there's a lot of differences in different parts of the world. And there are some parts of the world, as David talked about, Dave Anderson talked about, that you cannot raise crops. And so they, they kind of came at it from a, a point where you could just raise about anything, any place you wanted. And we cannot raise coffee in the United States. We're looking at ways to do that. We're actually do looking at GMO or using genetically modified uh, coffee to be able to do that. But in reality, we cannot do that currently in the United States. So it also so it assumes land uses can easily be changed. Okay, it takes years to change. You know, going from a crop to a an almond pasture, it takes at least three years once planting for that to produce a crop. Same thing with peaches. Assumes crops are primarily used for feed, but uh, but generally they're not for livestock. In fact, only what 18% of what cattle eat, for example, actually would be used for could be used for humans. It assumes animals are raised for food only. Uh, Food only supply that they only supply meat. It assumes no technology improvements over the next 30 years, where we've had significant improvements in our technology, and I think we'll see that when we go through the Texas Panhandle and look at all the things that they're researching up there on irrigation and use of pesticides and other things like that. So, and also ignore the efficiencies of modern production agriculture, um, and they also ignore. Studies like this one from the World Health Organization or World Health Association that looked at stunting policy brief. And in this brief, they looked at ways to reduce growth problems in countries, particularly underdeveloped countries. And basically their recommendation is increase um, the consumption of food from animal sources. Okay, if you look at that last sentence, it says evidence suggests that greatly, uh, that greater dietary Diversity and the consumption of food from animal sources are associated with improved linear growth. And so again, there are many countries where just having enough of the right kinds of food is really critical. And, and just changing that whole production system within those countries probably would be very, very difficult. All right, sustainable, and so that's what, you know, our, uh, just going back to that, that's why we have our, um, our international ag programs going throughout and many of our, our faculty here on campus are going out into the world to try to help them be more productive and be more diverse in the foods that they do produce but at the same time do it in a more efficient manner. All right, so um, also this is not just uh, uh, us in the United States saying this, this is UK and then basically this particular group of scientists said that if we went to the East Lancet's rec diet recommendations that they could not provide enough food uh, in their country and be self-sustaining because much of their land is uh, only good for grass production. The other thing and kind of last point on that particular issue is that animals are in a lot of ways a food storage system. So whether it's milk or hides or meat, okay, we they, they have animals and they raise those animals and they don't have refrigerators to put the meat in, they don't have freezers to put it in. And so the animals themselves in many of these countries is how they store their food. Because what they'll do is they'll harvest that animal on a given day and that animal will be consumed within that day. And so they do that every single day. And if you look at most, uh, in many, many countries, I've been in China and Korea, you'll go to what they call their markets, and that is animals that have been harvested that day that are sold that day for consumption. Very, very common. And so uh, it, it is difficult to have perishable fruits and vegetables and be able to transport them from the United States to sub-Saharan Africa and expect them not to have significant waste in that food and uh, actually lose a lot of that food in that, that process. They also don't consider in their reports all the other contributions 
that animals have to other products. That's why within Path to the Plates, you'll notice that uh, Julie, you know, she kind of put this together as we went through, but every single one of the commodities talks about other products that come from that commodity. And I think that that's a real good way to think not only of uh, the nutrition side of it, but also the contributions of that particular product to society. So we're doing that for crops and fruits and vegetables as well as for animal foods uh, in Path to the Plates. All right, so just to, as we go through here, I think you all understand that we are in a big dilemma as we kind of finish in the last 10 minutes. You know, that we are have a growing world population, we have shrinking lands, we have the reality of hunger, mostly undernutrition, probably more than hunger today, uh, just not having the right nutrients, uh, the fears of production agriculture, the trusts, uh, truths that feed us, and of course growing populations in Texas and in the world, food security issues throughout the world. You know, if you look at when there's not food enough, there is conflict in those those regions and many of the problems that we see in our world today is be, actually started from food issues and food security issues and you all have seen these slides large population if we look at uh, or at least you saw this set of this three or four slides uh, just to remind you you know huge undernourishment in those large population countries if we look at grain production why do we produce a lot of grain in the United States? Because we have the land and resources and water to do that, the technology to do that. And so because we don't have a large population, we don't have an undernourishment issue, we export a lot of the grain products. And a lot of our food is exported to those places that are desperate for it throughout the world. All right, so the U.S. is a blessed land because we have the right soils, the right water, we compare us to the world. There are a few regions in Europe that are similar, a few regions in South America. But you know, if you take you talk about Australia, there's only you know that western edge of that, um, or I guess the eastern edge of that that actually can do a lot of fruits and vegetables. The rest of it is desert, and we might put a few cattle out there, but that's about it. And if you look at many of the countries that are now having conflict in the middle of the the world. Uh, they cannot grow fruits and vegetables in that area, so they will be would be heavily uh, have to heavily rely on food from coming uh, from the United States and other parts of the world because of the soil systems that we have, because of the the technology that we have, the types of corn that we produce in the United States, we are able to produce more with fewer resources with fewer acres than other places in the world. So technology is another issue that as uh, we need to, to be able to help consumers have a better understanding of why we do what we do. Now I think we always need to examine that technology and make sure that whatever we do is actually a benefit to the environment, a benefit to the animal, uh, that we don't go one technology too far. Uh, but I always talk about that with respect to my students is making sure that that technology does not take us to a place where we're actually at the detriment of the health and welfare of that animal. And same thing when we look at water, and when we look at land resources. In fact, much of our work now in research is to try to minimize the impact of uh, annual productions on those particular resources. So technologies have changed the world. Uh, you know, if we look at where we were producing and what we were using to produce agricultural crops back in the 40s, okay, and back in the 20s, it was mules and horses. And then tractors came in, and that was really the biggest reason that we see, going back to this slide, a tremendous increase in the efficiency of agriculture and the production of agriculture and the minimizing of resources as we go into production. If you look at corn, for example, Okay, we are, in 1950, we had eight, uh, 82.9 million acres, and we produced 2.7 billion bushels of corn. Today, or 2013, we produced uh, 87.8 million acres, still a few more acres, but we are producing 504% of what we produced back in 1950, and that's because of technologies, and the main technology is tractors. 
we are continually to go down that road. Precision agriculture is going to take us to a whole new level, and we're going to learn about that when we go up to the panhandle. I'm excited about that. Whether it's GPS or uh, it's on the ground or drones, uh, we are seeing a tremendous kind of revolution of these new technologies in agriculture, and it's going to improve technology. This is a robot that specifically looks for weeds and it will harvest that particular weed and remove that one weed. And so that's a new technology that we can use to try to minimize pesticides and insecticide use. You know, if we look at just something simple as artificial insemination, okay, in the dairy industry, back in the starting in the 50s, they were able to use artificial insemination at a high rate where instead of using bulls in natural service, they would use the best bulls, they would collect those bulls and use that through an AI service. They were able to tremendously improve the genetics of the dairy cattle throughout out the United States. And that tremendously revolutionized the number of cattle that we need, how much milk a cow produced, and how many resources are required for those animals. So for example, in 1944, in order to produce 60 pounds of milk, you see that in the middle, we needed four cows. And you, every cow has a maintenance required. You have requirements. You have to meet that maintenance requirements. And then any additional production, like for milk or for producing a calf, you have to have that either growth for lactation or uh, maintenance or uh, nutritional uh, benefits. And so you, every cow, you have a minimum uh, a minimum maintenance requirement. Well, if you can minimize the number of cattle that you need, you reduce the lands, you reduce the crops that you need, you reduce actually the fertilizer coming out the other end, you reduce the, the water that's used, you reduce the methane production in those cattle. So because of technologies like artificial insemination, just one technology, it dramatically improved the cattle production. If we compare the United States cattle or dairy cattle production you can see in this chart, okay, more milk, and we compare that to Mexico and India. You see how many more cows it put, you have to have in India. More cows mean more methane gas, okay, just to you know produce the milk that you need. And you notice that there's a significantly lower amount of milk that's being produced even from those cows. So GMOs is something that we will continue to talk about as we go through this tra uh, these trainings and champions. We've already done that and do that more, but we understand that, of course, GMOs have been used for years in the animal and the human health world, that there are agencies that oversee the use of genetically modified organisms in our crops, and that there are scientists that have said they're safe and that ge generally GMOs have allowed us to um, if we didn't have those, we'd have lower yields, we'd have increased land uses, increased greenhouse gases, increased food prices. And so in reality, that is important, particularly when you look at this slide. You know, there are water shortages that are cropping up. GMO crops allow us to grow crops in areas and grow, grow crops that are more tolerant to that drought and will allow that food production to continue in those areas that where it might actually stop because of the drought conditions. And so that's just an example of how that particular technology, as we go forward with it, is good. Now we have to have an ethical and moral background, background to that, and we can talk more about that as we go forward in the future. We'll skip, we'll talk more about beef production when we get to the panel. I, I do like this one slide though. Um, it does talk about if we went, because a lot of people say, let's go back to the 1950s where we we're all just grass feeding our animals predominantly. And if we look at the systems back then versus today, that would be the conventional system versus if we went totally grass-fed, we'd need another 64 million head of cattle to produce the same amount of beef that we're producing today. And so with that, that means 64 more million animals all have a maintenance requirement. All, that means more lands, more greenhouse gas, more water, more feed, and all the other things that go with that. All right. So I think... We'll probably just call it that. We'll cover these other issues. Um, I do want to end with this slide. When we talk about sustainability, as we went through and talked about worldviews, or sustainability has been really put into these three circles. 
uh, environment, economy, and society. And so environment is, so when we think about sustainability, we're doing things that are good for the environment in the long term. Economy means that we're able to su sustain that business over a long period of time. So that would be the farmer thinking, then if you ask them sustainability, they say, well, am I going to be able to pass this farm down to the next generation? If you ask an environmentalist, sustainability is, well, I need to make sure that that land is being used in the right way so it'll be here for, for generations. For you know, We leave it in the same condition that we got it. And as agriculturalists, we should, should uh, strive to do that. Society comes from all different worldviews. So you have the worldview of people that shouldn't even use animals for food products and people that say, well, you need to use animals in the right way and do it in a humane way. And so that society is more that worldview issue. All of these have worldview issues, I guess, as you think about it. But those three overlap, and that is what we're looking at when we actually look at issues within individual industries with respect to sustainability. And that's what that Eats Lancer report was really trying to address, is how are we going to be sustainable, produce the food for the billions of people that are coming in the world. And I think as I looked at the, the data, and I have read through the entire report, that they are just missing a lot of the information as far as land use and other things that animal food products does provide. So as you take a look at it, hopefully I've given you some things to think about, and uh, we'll kind of end it at that and see if you guys have any questions. And Julie, I guess, is there any questions that you see on the chat or comments even? I'm, I'm open to lots of comments. Dan, I don't see any questions, um, but one comment I have is that hopefully this presentation specifically will uh, really make you think about, as Dan said earlier, the worldview, and because that's really what we want Pass the Plate to, to do, is to challenge you to look beyond just your own worldview, um, to learn to appreciate others. You may not agree with their worldview, but at least to appreciate, um, and that's something that we want to challenge you to do, and something we'll talk more about when we get to Amarillo. So, Sort of your homework between now and Amarillo is to, is to start looking at and, and really making yourself more aware of what's going on around you and how others view the world, not, not just uh, we, we have a tendency, and I'm, I'm guilty, to silo ourselves into our own view, but you know, start looking at others and see how they, they view the world, and we'll talk about some of those differences um, when we get to Amarillo. Uh, Jesse asked about the infographics available to be shared with, via social media. And the answer is yes. Yeah. Yes. When, when I will. Uh, I'm glad you said that. So this presentation will be on the champions for you to refer to and to utilize. Um, as far as infographics, I think before we put them out, I, I will try to put together some infographics from my slides that I know we have the right to use. Does that make sense? So you know, you can use things for education. Just putting things on social media. Let's, let me make sure that. Uh, that we are not going to have copyright issues, if that's okay. Does that make sense, uh, Julie? Anything on that? Any your no, that's you're exactly right on that. Once you transpose them over to social media, sometimes that copyright issues change a little bit. So we need to just clarify on those. Any other questions or comments? I agree, Kathy. Great information. Um, I, I learn something every time I listen to a presentation, either from Dan or from uh, David Anderson, either one. And so I enjoyed today as well. I actually have Matt Boche. He's sitting here in the, we're in Brenham, Texas today at the Southeast Region Training. So he's sitting beside me and sitting in on the training as well. So uh, nice that previous champions are also still wanting to learn as well. So. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate Matt and the other champions because they have done a, a great job and and, and trying to help multiply that. And this 2019 group, man, you guys, I don't know, 2017, they're in trouble. You guys are, <laughs> there's no doubt about it. Way to go. All right, that, Julie, I'm going to turn it over to you for this final comments and any thoughts about youth. Um, Will, just final comments on, on youth, and I'll share a lot more of this than when we get to Amarillo. We do have some um, updates and things coming up. Uh, we spoke earlier um, at other meetings about the website, and so I think we've, we're getting close to, to releasing that for youth. And if you haven't gone and looked at the Youth Expo, the activity book, and I will bring some hard copies uh, with, to Amarillo with me, I encourage you to, to look at those and start thinking about how you will utilize those next year. Um, I think they're a great addition to 
the resources that we already have. And so um, again, we we just have started developing some newer resources. I know with herbs and different things that have come forward in the last few weeks. And um, I think you'll just we'll just start just keep building our resource for youth and adults. Um, for his final comments, um, I'm looking forward to being with you on Amarillo. I did not get the chance to be with you in the Valley, so I'm looking forward to traveling to the, uh, Panhandle and being there with you in Amarillo and Lubbock, I should say. And uh, again, just uh, encourage you to start you know, looking at the, the world differently than you might traditionally look at it and, and expand your scope and um, learn you know, what others' worldview are or is, because that way you'll learn you know, some techniques of how you'll you know, educate those that have a different worldview than yourself.